Hello, one and all. It's my view, Doc Stone, chapter 224, In Space. And I've got to say, I was rather surprised this chapter because nothing went wrong. Absolutely nothing went wrong. The rocket launched properly. The valve watches worked properly. Senk and the rest of them all woke up properly. Everything went exactly according to plan. And that is seriously, seriously freaking me out. Where is the traitor? What is the traitor up to? What is going on with the traitor? I mean, we don't know. We just don't know at this point. And it's weird. It is really, really weird. I mean, my best guess that maybe the Medusa can store multiple orders at once. Like, for instance, say person A said, Medusa, uh, 50 meters, 50 seconds. And then person B said, Medusa, 25 meters, 25 seconds. Then in 25 seconds, the Medusa will petrify 25 meters. But then would it still keep the original order in its memory bank? Would it still know that in another 25 seconds, it should petrify 50 meters around it? I mean, that makes sense. It is an incredibly highly advanced piece of technology. So I could see it having that feature, and maybe Ukiya or whoever the trader is put in an original order before, you know, the order to petrify Senko and the rest of them. And therefore, you know, when they're up in space, just everything seems to be going okay. The original order will activate and everyone's going to be petrified before they have a chance to reset the Rabba watches. I mean, maybe, maybe. That is the best guess, the best guess I have as for what the trader's planning right now. If there even is a trader, I mean, we still don't actually know if there's a trader or not, but the Medusa activating itself, that is so, so weird. And it's really hasn't been addressed since it happened. I mean, I think last chapter, uh, Zeno said they tried to recreate the experience, they tried to recreate the phenomenon, but they couldn't make it happen no matter what they did. So, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I'm really, really not sure what to make of that. But putting the traitor aside for right now, let's just take a second to appreciate the fact they are in space. Senku made it to freaking space. He fulfilled his lifelong goal, his lifelong ambition. He is actually in outer freaking space right now, eating ramen. <sighs> oh, I love it. I absolutely freaking love it. And I love the way this chapter starts, literally showing, you know, the entire history of Earth. All the way from the times of the Great Mammoth, to the Stone Age people, to ancient Rome, to modern Japan, to... You know, when the Medusa first activated, first petrified everyone except those on the International Space Station. And then, you know, history started all over again. Senku started over with stone tools, but he moved very, very quickly through it. Going from stone tools, to making iron, to making freaking rocket engines. And now, finally, finally, he is standing where his father once stood. Eating what his father once ate. He is eating ramen in space, people. He is freaking eating ramen in space. The Stone Age has ended, and the age of technology has begun. Woo! And this is really shown by the fact that Senku has finally lost his crack scars. He's finally, you know, no longer scarred by the Stone Age. He's finally a normal human again. Huzzah! I mean, Senku has been petrified a few times throughout this series, but this is the first time where the scars ever fully disappeared. He is back to normal. They've brought back the age of technology that Japan once knew before they were all petrified. I mean, cell phones still weigh 40 pounds. That's something, you know, they need to work on. Or wait, 40 kilograms, sorry. But at the same time, you know, they're in space. They're freaking eating ramen in space. So, so yeah, now the Stone Age is completely and utterly dead. Huzzah! Oh, and also, it seems like our three astronauts might be naked inside these uh, big spacesuits, which... Interesting, I did not see that coming. Uh, I also didn't see them actually taking the spacesuits off coming either. I figured, you know, they're spacesuits. You wear them in space. But I guess they're more designed for, you know, when Senka and the rest of them are actually enough to travel on the surface of the moon, walk around there. I mean, that does explain, you know, how Stanley's planning on using that chewing tobacco that Zeno gave him. I assume it'd be weird because, you know, he has the big, you know, space helmet on his head. He can't really chew tobacco. He has nowhere to spit it. But it makes way more sense if they're actually going to be able to take those suits off and just walk around, at least in the space shuttle itself. On the surface of the moon, though, that's a whole other question, because, you know, because I'm still not exactly sure why Stanley was needed, why Stanley's sharpshooting skills were needed, when they don't really have the finger dexterity inside the spacesuit to actually pull the trigger of a gun all that well. So, weird. Very, very weird. Anyway, though, speaking of them being naked, it seems like everyone got a spiffy new outfit. Senku looks absolutely modern in his design. Uh, Stanley looks more or less the same. And as for Kwaku, I mean, her dress is fairly similar to what she was wearing before, but definitely a more modern, more stylish design. I really like that on her. Good for you, Kohaku. But before either of those two wake up, Senku realizes, wait a minute. Why am I all alone in space? That shouldn't have happened, right? 
only to realize that Zeno is so overwhelmingly mushy. Oh my god. <laughs> Seriously, Zeno actually gave Senku a few minutes by himself to just bask in the majesty of space to actually shed a few tears as he looks down Earth the same way his father did all those thousands of years ago. <laughs> oh, that was just so mushy. I absolutely freaking loved it. And of course, Stanley knew exactly what Zeno was planning, which is why he isn't surprised at all when he sees Senku waiting for him after he wakes up. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. And we get two rather interesting lines from Zeno here. First off, he comments about how in the 20th century, they actually designed a spaceship that had no windows, and the pilots protested, which, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, seriously, who wants to go to space and not see outside of it? I mean, yes, the windows are dangerous. They are a huge point of failure, and if anything's going to go wrong on a spaceship, it's probably going to be, you know, the jagged glass that could break and kill everyone on board. But at the same time, I mean, really, why go to space if you can't look outside the window? That'd be like going to the Grand Canyon while blindfolded. It'd be utterly and completely pointless. But he also comments here about how they've been given enough oxygen to spare, which is concerning. Very, very concerning. I mean, on modern day spaceships, they have oxygen generators, like free breathers, whatever you call it, that allow them to have a nearly limitless source of oxygen. But the fact that they were given a set amount here makes me think that at some point... Uh, something is going to go terribly, terribly wrong, and they're going to, you know, basically be running out of oxygen, running low on oxygen, and they'll need to find some way to either make more or get to Earth as quickly as possible before they all suffocate and die. I mean, let's not forget, you know, when Bakia first came back from Earth, or wait, no, not him, uh, when the other astronauts first came down from Earth, they almost suffocated because the Soyuz capsule flipped upside down, and they weren't able to get out for 10 hours, and they were very, very close to death by the time that Byakuya managed to steal a boat and row it all the way out to reach them. So that's a red flag right there. That is definitely, definitely a red flag right there. But Zena mentions the auction to remind them that, you know, you guys have a third pilot, you have a third traveling companion, don't you want to go wake her up? <laughs> and based on the look on their faces, I think they both honestly forgot that Kohaku was there, which... Oh, that is sad. That is so, so sad. Though Kohaku was definitely having a fun time being up in space, being able to see the Earth down below, and being completely and utterly weightless like this. I mean, she looks happy. She looks very, very happy. And then they have the space ramen. They eat the same meal that Senku's father had in space all those thousands of years ago when the Earth was first petrified. And then we get a really, really weird comment this chapter. Kohaku asked if the space station could still be up and running, still be floating in space after all these thousands of years. And Senku says no. Senku says there's no way. And then Kohaku responds with, is that so? I mean, this doesn't seem like she's upset or sad about the news. It seems like she is perplexed. Like what Senku said doesn't make any sense to her. Could it be that when Kohaku was looking out the window of the spaceship, she saw something floating out there? She saw something man-made out there in the vast reaches of space? I mean, that would make a lot of sense, given her incredible vision. But at the same time, that's concerning. That is very, very concerning. What is it exactly that she saw up there? What kind of satellite could still be up and running right now? I mean, I think anyone who's read the Dr. Stone spinoff has a fairly good idea of what they're referring to. But at the same time, that was considered non-canon. The author has said many, many times it was non-canon. I mean, is he just trolling us? Is he going to say, okay, yeah, some parts that were non-canon, but the story itself was actually canon, and that's why I say it was non-canon? <laughs> oh, that'd be fun. That'd be a lot of fun. But I think the much more realistic uh, explanation is that the Y-Man has a satellite circling the globe, and that satellite is going to cause a whole bunch of problems for them. The satellite is going to attack them and try to shoot them out of space, which would be concerning. That'd be very, very concerning. I mean, I definitely think Kohaku saw something, but I'm just really not sure what it is right now, and it's honestly more terrifying than Trader right now. But anyway, though, then the second module launches into space and locks properly in the first one. Huzzah! Great shot. I definitely see why they needed a supercomputer now. And now they only have, you know, three more modules, three more chances for something to go absolutely and completely wrong, horribly, horribly, so, yeah, that's concerning, that's definitely concerning, but I'm really not sure what's gonna happen next, I mean, I guess they're going to the moon now, I, are they gonna wait for the other three modules, or do they just need these two to actually make it to the moon, I actually think on the first page we saw five rockets launched all at the same time, so or six rockets launch all at the same time, so curious about that. Are they actually going to, you know, all unite together to form one ultimate Gundam weapon? Wait, not Gundam. Uh, Megazord. Megazord. Up in space right now, or... Mm, not sure about that. Not sure about that. 
And then I guess it's time to actually go to the moon. I mean, next chapter, we might actually get a chance to see what the Y-Man's base really looks like. I mean, we saw it before, but it was like this grainy smudge we couldn't really make anything out of. They might get close enough next chapter where we can actually see what it really, truly looks like. And I'm uh, kind of terrified. I am kind of terrified. But please, link the all down below. What do you think their new space outfits? What do you think the fact that they have finally, finally reached space? We finally have a chance to eat ramen in space all over again. The height of human culture and civilization. Uh, what exactly is going to happen with the other three modules? What's going to go wrong? Is there a trailer out there? What did Kohaku see? Why did Kohaku act so strangely when Senku said there's no way the space station could still be up and running? And why didn't she say anything else? Why didn't she say, I saw something out there? Why didn't she try to you know, further explain what she was thinking in this moment. And, uh, what's gonna go wrong? What's gonna go right? What's waiting for them on the moon? Who the freak is the Y-Man? Any, you know, final minute theories might have before we actually get some definitive, answer, definitive answers in the next couple chapters. Let me know down below. Be sure to like and subscribe. See you on my next video. And until then, peace!